Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome, and thank you for attending this webinar, this session. And we have with us myself, Frank Yu. I'm the Principal Application Experience Architect for Kemp Technologies. And we have a great guest with us today, Arthur, Arthur Kane. He is the Head of Product Marketing for our Flowmon Product Division. And we're here to talk about streamline network detection and response to cyber threats. And this is going to be a very interesting discussion today. So first, a couple of housekeeping things. This webinar will be recorded and available on demand, of course. And we are going to have some uh, Q&A session at the end of this. So if you have any questions, please go to the questions section on your on your. Um, display there for the Bright Talk session, and please enter your questions, and we're more than happy to answer them at the end of this presentation. And Arthur, he has been with Flimon for quite a few years in various capacities. He is uh, a great technologist, a great speaker, and I've had a lot of interesting conversations with him about technology and what's going on and how this cool technology that we have that we're going to talk about today influences and impacts your ability to see things on the network and really get things uh, going smoothly. So Arthur, do you have a few things to say about yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone uh, from Europe and good morning over across the, across the ocean. Frank, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it was very interesting to have all those conversations with you. Um, you have cybersecurity background yourself, so it was really easy to to explain things to you. And I'm really happy that we can do this webinar today. Uh, and I think all of you guys will receive a great value and we'll try to explain how um, attacks, modern attacks work and how we can protect uh, ourselves from them in a variety of ways and multi-layering our security approach to, to, to provide the best protection possible. Uh, my background is also technical. Uh, and that's why I like to jump into uh, more detailed and technical conversations. And I'm here for all of your questions. And yeah, over to you, Frank. Awesome. Thank you very much, Arthur. And again, this presentation, let me bring up our slides here. Again, streamline network detection and response to cyber threats. And this is important because <clears throat> we say this all the time. You can't defend against what you can't see. So we're going to talk about how these attacks work, kind of break it down and break down what these hackers and attackers are doing on your network, and then get into a nice discussion on what can you do to get good visibility and appropriate visibility that's actionable to be able to protect yourself against these threats that you see on your network that are happening. Because we hear about all the time in the news about, you know, Companies getting attacked, ransomware, and we're going to talk focus on ransomware in this discussion and really discuss how this works and what, why, why are they doing it and what can you do to really protect it. So let's talk about what we're going to be discussing today. So the first thing is, what is ransomware? And some of you may have a good idea what it is, but to keep us all on the same page, and I'm just going to read this here real quick because I think it is pretty succinct and relevant. Ransomware is a type of malicious software or malware designed to deny access to a computer system or data until ransom is paid. Ransomware typically spreads through phishing emails or by a victim unknowingly visiting an infected website. So these attackers, these hackers, are penetrating your network, gaining access to your systems and taking control of your data. They're taking control of your systems and your data so that they that you don't have access to it until you pay them and pay them usually in some sort of monetary way to be able to get control of your data again. And this is very scary because everything that we do on the network, everything that we do in the business depends upon this data that we have. And if you don't have access to it, it's a problem. And we've seen this and we've heard this in the news about like um, healthcare institutions, hospitals, where their data has been taken from them. They don't have access to it. And now they can't do their job. And you can see like, for example, in the healthcare industry, this is critical because now you can't provide the care to your patients. 
So there's a physical impact to this ransomware attacks, not just from, you know, accessing data and keeping the business going and things like that, but people's lives, people's livelihoods are at stake with these ransomware attacks. And it is very scary. And when we talk about ransomware, there are many ways that they work. And here's um, a study that was done by this company, Coveware. And they looked at the top types of ransomware. And here you can see they've listed three different types of ransomware, Phobos, Ryok, and Sudonokibi. Um, and it's not as important for you to know that the types of ransomware, but how do they attack you? And you can see that the most common methods, and this is true across the board, are really consist of three main types of attacks. Number one is email phishing. This is you getting an email and your the email says, do this, or I need to do something. <clears throat> Excuse me. You need to click on something and you end up clicking on it. And because of that, your system gets infected. Now they have access to it. And from there, they then branch out to other ways to the, the rest of the systems on your network. RDP, remote desktop protocol. So for Windows systems and other types of systems, being able to access these systems in a virtual manner to gain control of the desktop, to gain control of the system is a very common method for them to attack your systems as well. And the third way that they attack your systems is software vulnerabilities, bugs in the software that they can gain access. They can gain privileges that they don't shouldn't normally have through these software vulnerabilities. And that then they can gain control of that system and again, spread out gain control of other systems. And once they can gain control of the systems that are matter, the ones that hold the data repositories, the ones like your laptop or your desktop that hold the data for your personal information or your personal work, then they can take control of that data and again, hold it ransom until you pay them off to get access back to it. So this can be very scary and we need to understand how do they do this? And what can we do to detect these threats when they're occurring in your network, occurring on your systems, and then you know, obviously then remediate in some way, whether remediation might be software patches, changing policies on my security devices, like my firewalls, my intrusion prevention systems, et cetera. But we need to find ways to then protect ourselves against that. But the first thing and foremost is, we need to know that this is happening. And the scary thing is this could be happening a lot on your network. You may not be knowing, you may not know about it. So what does ransomware, how does it affect you? And it is very, very clear that ransomware has a huge impact, as we know in the news and the media and these uh, articles that we see, that it, it, it causes a major disruption in your networks. Mm -hmm. And the impact is that 75% of the time that these attacks are occurring, mm -hmm. they succeed in encrypting your data. And when I say encrypt your data, this means that they have the key to unlock that data. And only they have the key and they are basically holding your data ransom to say, we have locked this data away. And unless you pay us, we won't give you that key. So 75% of these texts are encrypting your data. The good thing it kind of is that it takes time for this to work. From the time that these attacks start on your network, it takes about three to nine days for them to go through the process of identifying the hosts, of compromising, finding the vulnerabilities and attack and getting access before they actually deploy this ransomware and actually attack your network. So you have some time, but it's a limited window of time for you to figure out what is happening. And this is where we really need to focus on. And the third thing that I want to mention here, and this is something that people think, well, they think, oh, I'm in the cloud. I'm in the public cloud. This means that I'm protected. I'm using AWS. I'm using Azure. So therefore, they're going to protect me because it's there. No, that is not the case. 50% of the data that is encrypted is in public clouds. 
just because you're in public cloud does not mean you're protected. So you can't assume that these public clouds are going to be taking control and managing your security profiles for your systems and for your data. You have to take control of that and you have to be able to identify and respond appropriately as individuals and as businesses determine what is going on on your network. And this is critical. It is up to you as a business, as an IT organization, to manage these threats occurring on your network. So let's talk about how these hackers go through the process to identify, to attack, to take control of your data. Because there are some very key steps and fairly common steps that they do. And they use different methods in these steps, but they, there are techniques that they do as a typical hacker to be able to get into your network and then to take control of the various hosts and the data on those hosts. So let's see what they do. One of the first thing they need to do is discover your network. In other words, they're using tools to be able to map out your network and the devices on your network. These could be servers, network devices, individual hosts on people's desks. And they use tools, common tools, and some of them are useful tools in IT organizations for such as Nmap. Nmap is a tool to be able to probe and look at the network and find out what devices are listening for what certain applications. They do things like ICMP sweeps. In other words, they ping across the network. They'll take your network ranges, your IP address ranges, and do a simple ICMP ping to see which devices respond. Does this IP address actually sit on your network? Is there a host associated with it? They'll do TCP and UDP sweeps. So they'll say, okay, now that I've identified these hosts, what ports are these hosts listening on to? Are they listening to port 25, which is SMTP, which is email? Are they listening to port 80, which is HTTP web? They are listening to port UDP 53, which is DNS. So they identify the hosts on your network, and then they identify what are these hosts doing? What is their purpose? Are they servers? Are they the, these people's desktops and laptops? Are they storage devices where they have databases? And they can find out what these devices are doing through these discovery techniques. So they are using the network to be able to probe out with these different probes, ICMP, TCP, UDP, at the network layer to understand what is going on in terms of how you have built your network. Because once they can do that, they can identify what are the potential hosts that they can attack and compromise. The next thing they do is they try to get credentials. They try to get access to these hosts. And one of the most common ways is password spraying or what we call brute force attacks. They have this list of commonly used passwords. So you hear all the time people saying, don't use passwords that are common. Password one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Don't use passwords that are commonly used. And the reason is because these hackers know that these passwords are common. And they will have this list, this file of passwords, and they will take that list and try to use them against your devices to try to gain access. And sooner or later, and it's very common, more common than that we would think, one of those passwords in that password list works, and they have now have access for that user account mm -hmm. to that system there is a decent chance that that user account has privileges because they're an administrator so that they have full access to the system if not they can get user access and then they can find other vulnerabilities to get, upgrade their access to a different level so that it can have administrator access but password attacks where they're <clears throat> excuse me spraying and attacking these hosts which is these password lists, these dictionaries, 
is very common and very standard because it's simple and it's easy for them to do. Hackers are lazy and they will take the easiest path to get access. And if you are lazy also and give them that method to be able to do it, they will take advantage of it. They also take advantage of vulnerabilities. So here we had a zero day bug for Windows RDP desktop protocol to be able to get virtual desktop access to Windows machines. And in this case, the zero day bug I'm discussing or showing you here was something called Blue Keep, which was a bug discovered in 2019 in the summer of 2019 for Windows remote desktop protocol. But there are many bugs out there and not just for Windows desktop protocol. There are other bugs, you know, bugs available that exist for it. There are bugs for other versions of software. There's SQL bugs, PHP bugs. There are bugs for other pieces that they can try to use and leverage to gain access. And the scary thing here is that these bugs often, in this case, it could have been a zero day when it was identified, but once it's identified, then companies like Microsoft and these other companies will release patches to install to mitigate this vulnerability. But if you are not staying on top of your software patches and your hot fixes, then your systems are still vulnerable. And the problem here is that the hackers know about it. The internet community knows about these vulnerabilities. And now they will look for the systems that have not been patched and they will gain access to the systems that, that aren't patched. So you need to stay on top of your patches. But having said that, they will continue to use these attack methods to see if these systems are vulnerable. So these are things that you could possibly see on the network. Looking for these attack methods on the network to see if they are using them and if there is somebody that is not supposed to be on your network attacking your systems. Another method, we see this in, in the movies all the time, at least I do, because I watch a lot of hacker and tech movies, is key loggers. And we see <laughs> things about where people use key loggers to track what I'm typing on my computer so that they can track my me logging into something, typing my username, typing my password, and they get access to it. It's real. It's not just in the movies. It's in real life, and it is a very common tool. They will install... Once they get user access to a system, they can now install a keylogger where they are tracking not just what I'm typing on the keyboard, but they can, as you can see in this uh, capture here, they can see your screen and they can actually see you moving the mouse and going to different devices and things like So they can get full access to see what you are doing on your computer so that they can mimic what you're doing to get access to devices that you have access to so that they can now take over and leverage your access to systems, get access to, to those systems as well. So you need to be very careful about what is happening on your systems, on your network, because they will, if they are in your network, they will find ways to collect, to collect these credentials to get administrator, to get privileged access to the data that they want to hold hostage that you are trying to protect or use. And then you have to now pay them or do something to get it back. Once they have all this data, they need a way to get it back to them so they can take advantage of it. This is the exfiltration, taking the data that they found and information that they found on your network and bringing it back to them so they can take advantage of it. This is the exfiltration. And they can use tools so that your network can't really tell what is happening or your network is designed to be open so that it can pass information out. So you need to have these outbound filters, and you probably do have some outbound filters to say, I'm not going to allow these types of traffic going out my network. The problem is these hackers are pretty smart. They're going to use tools like ICMP. Everybody allows ICMP. I need to ping hosts. I need to be able to see what's going on with the, using this protocol. 
But you know what? These hackers can put payloads into this IP, ICMP traffic using tools and send the data out. Whether it's usernames and passwords, whether it's actual data from your systems using ICMP to get back to them because they know that you're not going to be blocking it. Other things they might be doing is using what something called a reverse SSH, SSH tunnel. SSH is a protocol for me to securely access my systems for administrative or user access. And so SSH port 22, TCP port 22 is very common to be open. Well, they can create a tunnel coming back to, to the other side to say, okay, not only did I create this SSH tunnel, but now I can create this tunnel within it to send data back. A third common method that they use for exfiltration is DNS. Everybody allows DNS. But DNS, in theory, the protocol is all about, you know, asking what is the IP address for this name or what is the name for this IP address. But again, that's how the protocol is designed, but they can put payloads in the DNS and UDP 53 which, um, to be able to send data that they care about in big chunks so that they can then recombine it and get the information that they want. There are many ways for them to get the data out of your network without you knowing or without you having the protections to stop that data from getting out of your network. It is very hard to protect your data, keeping your data within your network with these exfiltration techniques that these hackers use. So you got to be very careful. Number one, don't get let them in. And number two, be very careful about what's going on in their network to see how the network is, how they are getting the data out of the network. And what is the impact of all this? The impact is number one, like I mentioned at the beginning, they're going to encrypt your files so that you don't get access to your data. And very often they will have something pop up on this, on your on your system to say your files are encrypted. And by the way, because your file is encrypted, you don't have access to your files and your data, and you have to do something to be able to unlock it so that you get access to them again. This is the probably the most common thing that you hear in the news about what these hackers are doing in terms of ransomware to be able to attack you and then make you do something or pay to stop the attack. Encrypt your data. You don't have access to it. And then you have to do something like go to backups. And these backups may be old. They may be a day old. They may be two days old. They may be a week old. So you've lost some data in the meantime. How can you protect against this happening? This is a very scary thing. This is a real thing. We, again, hear about in the news all the time where people are having these problems that their networks have been attacked, their files have been encrypted, and they're trying to decide whether they pay these thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to get their information back. The other thing that they'll do is they'll possibly say, I'm going to post this on the internet if you don't pay me. And this can be scary also because a lot of the information that you have is proprietary. There's intellectual property. There may be sensitive information that you don't want the public to know, depending upon the business that you're in. So unless you pay, they will post it on the internet. So for the world to see, and this can be very damaging from a brand. This can be very, be very damaging from a business perspective. And they're almost always going to ask you to pay in something, some sort of currency. Like in this case, you can see on this slide, Bitcoin. Why do they use Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin is basically anonymous. You can't 
track the transactions for Bitcoin. So just because you pay them off using some sort of Bitcoin transaction doesn't mean that you have a paper trail that you can find out who it is. That is not possible using these cryptocurrencies. So this is one of the dangers of cryptocurrencies. And speaking of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin has become very uh, volatile in terms of value. So Bitcoin years ago, when I remember probably 10 plus year, 10, I don't remember exactly how many, around 10 years ago, <clears throat> when Bitcoin came out, it was maybe $40 per Bitcoin. Well, nowadays, it's $30,000 plus per Bitcoin, and it's been going up very rapidly recently. What does this mean? This means that these attackers have more incentive to want to find your systems and to do this. Because paying one Bitcoin years ago was a few hundred or a few thousand dollars. Now it's $30,000 plus. So paying, in this example, two and a half Bitcoin, that's getting close to $70,000 or even $100,000. That is a lot of money. There is a lot of financial incentive for them to do this. There is a lot of financial incentive for them to find new systems to attack and compromise. And they don't care who you are. What they care about is that financial payout. It's not about social justice. It's not about politics usually. It's about financial compensation for what they're doing. And they will do everything they can to leverage that to get as extract as much financial compensation. So this is the dangerous part also, because you pay once, you get your stuff back. They know that you're vulnerable, number one, and two, they know you're going to pay. What does that mean? They're going to try again. They're going to do this again. They're going to keep on thinking. This is a vulnerable target that we can take advantage of. So you need to stop this early, quickly, and get to the point where you don't have to think about the payment. The impact of ransomware is real. The impact of ransomware is very dangerous for businesses in terms of the data integrity and access to that data because of encrypted files as well and public exposure. So what do we have today to, to be able to detect and manage this is very challenging. With all these different methods and tools that these hackers use to go through your network, to identify your network and attack your network, it is, there is potentially a large amount of information from the security devices, from the network devices, from the servers in terms of logging and information that really and truly it becomes overwhelming. There is so much information coming in, in terms of real and not real, that it becomes almost impossible for any human to really go through it on a regular basis and identify these attacks consistently. 70% of companies could have known about a data breach if they had properly looked at their logs. So you need some sort of intelligence, some sort of precursor, some sort of triage to identify what's going on. Number two is you may be using some sort of endpoint protection or some other protection technologies to protect your systems. They can be evaded. There are ways that hackers know to get around these systems. They know how these protection technologies work, so they find ways to get around it. On average, it takes 206 days to identify a network breach. Often we hear in the news that some company got attacked and their data got stolen. Could be personal information, personally identifiable information, PII or financial information, credit card information, bank account information, and is now available and all your accounts and everything are now compromised. We hear about that in the news, but the thing is, very often, we also read, if you read the fine print, that this happened a long time ago. And they're just now finding out about it because it took them a while to understand that, wow, 
my data got stolen or compromised and I didn't know it happened, number one. And two, when it does happen, when I do identify, I'm not sure exactly how they did it because it's been so long ago. Now I don't have the information. It's not relevant. I don't have the timely details of what's happened. And the third piece of the challenge is that these hackers are constantly changing their methods. They understand that people and technologists and businesses are installing different things and doing other things to try to identify and protect their networks against these attacks. So these hackers are changing their methods, just like with face recognition. Back in the old days, I could put a pair of sunglasses on and avoid face recognition systems. Or I could do other things to put in, you know, I could wear a hoodie or I can, you know, put on a fake mustache and beard. I have a real one, but I, I could make it look like that I look like someone different. Just recently, for example, there's uh, facial recognition systems I just read a few months ago where somebody could wear some glasses or some device on their head that sent back some infrared or ultraviolet light to basically wash out the cameras so that they can't detect me. So it's not noticeable, but now I am being blacked out. There are multiple methods that these hackers will take advantage of to get away, to avoid your methods of protecting and detecting. But you know what? Ultimately they are still leaving marks and footprints on your network they are still on there somewhere you just need to change your detection and mitigation methods to keep up with them so it's a game of leapfrog who is doing what and how can you detect this new method because jay changed that and now we need to change our system to do this we need to constantly keep ourselves up to date as well so we need to continuously look at how we can do things to protect against these types of attacks so understanding how these hackers work and some of the tools and methods that they use and understanding some of the challenges that we have to understand what is going on to detect and mitigate. I want to pass it over to Arthur. Arthur has some great information on understanding ransomware detection and response. And Arthur is going to go through some details of some of the technologies that we can use to create a more holistic and more, I'm going to say, generic method to detect and mitigate and respond against these types of attacks so that we don't have to worry as much about all these different issues and really get one nice, clean, holistic solution. So, Arthur, I'm going to pass it to you. and Please share with us some information that you have. Thank you, Frank. Um, it was very educational to learn different stages of the attack um and if there was one takeout for me uh that would be um the idea of minis minimizing attack surface you talked about simple methods that hackers use but yet those are very effective if we don't have uh, sufficient prevention from weak passwords um, to not paying attention to my emails and opening attachments with, uh, from unknown sources. And without proper prevention, there is no chance that we stand against attackers. And so my first recommendation will be pay attention to your security policies and try to minimize the, the potential um or the um attack surface for uh, for 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 hackers uh, however this is not enough this isn't sufficient and we need to be able to go beyond that we need to be able to detect malicious activity in our network once it gets in and for that purpose we have technologies and principles for ransomware and malware in general uh, detection and response we have to learn from experts 
And who are the best experts in cybersecurity today? Uh, it's security operation centers. Those people only go to work to spend their whole time trying to detect an attack, monitor its activity, learn its behavior, find the best means of responding, and creating prevention uh, actions based on their learnings. And one of the concepts implemented and widely used by SOCs today is called SOC Visibility Triad. And this, this is actually a framework or a principle, if you will, um, of protecting the network using three main pillars. Endpoint detection helps to protect end stations and laptops and tablets and phones um, from being infected with malicious software. Frank also talked about the time needed to discover a new type of attack, uh, which is which takes hundreds of days. And that's only because uh, attacks evolve and we need to be able to detect new type of attack and describe it and create signature for it only for endpoint detection to be able to work and, 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 and provide uh, full protection. During that time, endpoint detection and signature-based detection in general is not going to suffice. We also need to be able to collect log data and information about traffic and activity and users and systems across the whole network. And for that purpose, we can use SIEM. And SIEM systems uh, do two things, really. Um, collect logs and correlate them, and analyze them to provide more holistic view on the behavior of the network and users and systems and uh, give us better understanding um, of everything that's, that's happening in the network. Seam systems, however, are only as strong as sources of data they, they use. And endpoint detection response is a very strong source of data. Um, however, these are techniques that attackers know about, and they try to evade and 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 um, and slip under the radar. During that, they leave footprints scattered all of the all of the uh, network. It wouldn't be possible to infect a host without sending the malicious code over the network, unless you of course bring it over on a USB key. Um, it wouldn't be possible to contact um, this infected host and give it commands on the next actions without the network. It wouldn't be possible to collect data from Keylogger without the network. It wouldn't be possible to exfiltrate data or command stations to, to encrypt, um, encrypt uh, data. And so visibility into the network is of absolute essence in order to be able to track down um, attacks and malicious activities and detect them in their infancy and being able to respond to them. We talked about different stages of an attack. Uh, we took you through um, infection, discovery, uh, lateral movement, and this, um, this way of describing different stages of attack is called MITRE attack framework. And it's really helpful technique in being able to understand the current stage of the attack um, and choosing the right means of, of, uh, of response. Using the same framework, we can also map different capabilities of standard protection uh, means or systems. And on this framework or in this matrix, we're able to show you where protecting parameter of the network using firewalls is very important. We're trying to prevent attack uh, to exploit our systems and, and talk to us from the outer world. Using endpoint protection is super, super important um, in uh, both exploitation, but also protecting and detecting from uh, access to data and escalation of privileges. However, there are many more different stages that took quite a long time. Frank also talked about 
three to nine days uh, until the attack impact. And during this time, uh, attackers are active on the network. They leave the footprints. And during all these activities and time, we have actually the, 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 the possibility of detecting them. And so adding network into our protection strategy helps us to create multi-layer security model that gives us the best chance of protecting ourselves. Uh, network detection and response uh, is quite a general term. Uh, there are different methods and different techniques used uh, to uh, deliver these capabilities on the network level. And so to give you an idea of what type of data and what means of detection these technologies use, uh, we have this diagram. So the easiest way how to get to network data would be to uh, collect something, um, uh, actually to, to connect proprietary sensors on span port tabs and start collecting proprietary uh, data in, uh, in, in, in our case, uh, uh, our uh, product called Flowmon, uh, we talk about enriched network telemetry. This is non-invasive and passive uh, technique, uh, easy to deploy and provides wealth of information. However, often we're not able to get there. So for instance, let's say we have a remote site uh, where we don't want to invest into uh, purchasing sensors. We have a public cloud environment um, where we don't use uh, virtual tapping technology, but yet we can still get uh, enough information to be able to, um, to do appropriate detection with uh, flow data. So flow data is, um, is a way how we can monitor uh, traffic statistics about IP conversations of clients and servers. And this data is uh, widely accessible from network infrastructure components like routers, switches, or even firewalls. Uh, and only takes a few clicks or uh, maybe, um, maybe two lines in command line to, to start collecting this data. We can also rely on raw uh, packet and raw traffic data, collect user identity, even signatures that while uh, network detection and response is not based on using signatures uh, and not, not based on using this database of known attacks to be able to protect, it is great source of supplementary information once uh, an incident is reported and detected. Um, and then uh, threat intelligence feeds uh, such as malicious domains and hosts, command control uh, uh, domains or spammers. Uh, all this information can be of great value, uh, providing additional information to uh, our uh, detected events. All of this data is then, uh, is then uh, sent into a uh, detection uh, engine. In our case, we use about 40 uh, different uh, detection methods with over 200 individual algorithms that all simultaneously look for uh, different patterns, um, uh, different patterns uh, in the in the traffic. Uh, those could either be patterns that we actually put into uh, the, the the system, and we say behaviors such as um, trying multiple passwords without any luck over short period of time isn't the behavior we want to see in our network. We also use AI and machine learning to provide uh, anomaly detection, uh, uh, detection capabilities. And in that case, we really monitor activity of every individual user and host and system on the network. And we track uh, their movement, if you will, for long periods of time. And we look for deviations in their, uh, in their behavior. Other detection methods are based on more mathematical models or statistic, uh, uh, statistical detection, heuristics. And these help us to uh, look um, and distinguish between uh, behavior of user versus client um, and provide more depth of information uh, and better understanding of the attack itself.
At the end, what we get is a threat uh, anomaly alert uh, that we can um, that we can use uh, directly within the network detection uh, and response platform, or we can forward it into same systems, log management, or other security platforms. What benefits uh, does network detection and response bring? It is reduction of risk. We've learned today that it takes quite a long time for uh, an advanced attack to get into the impact stage. And during this time, while prevention uh, has already failed, we have the time to detect attacks and prevent major impact to hit on us. We are able to identify malicious hosts. We are able to ident uh, identify behavior that we do not want to see in, a, in our network and be able to respond and block these IP addresses, block these attackers before they strike. Having all this information at our fingertips, um, having, the, uh, having the severity, priority, understanding the full scale of the impact, understanding the full scale of the uh, attack surface and what IP addresses and which stations are involved in this attack, we are able to, to tremendously reduce the time needed for threat hunting. Um, that means without needing to spend much time on trying to investigate all the bits and pieces of the attack, we can see them on a single screen and make decisions fast and with confidence. And with that, minimizing the breach impact because the sooner we are able to respond this the, the the lower the impact will be and this response may not necessarily be manual it can be automated um, we can automatically instruct systems that are already present in your infrastructure such as firewall or network access control to put an ip address into quarantine or block it to prevent further spread of the attack or uh, data breach. And so with these technology principles in mind, let me uh, tell you a little bit more about our product called Flomo ADS. ADS is a network detection and uh, response solution based on network data. We primarily work with Flow and IPFIX uh, formats. These are extracted from routers, which is um, very soon, we will also uh, instruct, um, uh, um, digest this data from Camp Loadmaster. Um, so you will be able to leverage your current infrastructure uh, to uh, provide uh, an ultimate source of information for us to be able to perform detection. And we can also leverage our proprietary sensors called FOMO probes that are passively tapped into the network. And uh, apart from network uh, telemetry, we can also see into application layer, um, perform full packet capture and, and, and more. All this data is um, consolidated or um, uh, stored on a central console uh, called Collector. And we use this con uh, console to store the data, uh, perform manual analysis and report on it. And these capabilities can be extended with modules for deeper network troubleshooting uh, in today's case, and relevant to ransomware network detection and response, application performance monitoring, full packet capture, and DDoS protection. Flowmon ADS uh, has over 200 algorithms that look in different uh, stages of an attack and are capable of uh, um, reporting on incidents in their early stages. Um, we are able to track the incident across the whole network. And with that, lower the noise that the system uh, provides. We mentioned today that the number of logs today in today's networks is overwhelming. Being able to see across the network, which is the ultimate source of truth, where all the hosts and systems communicate, we have the privilege of understanding how individual parts or individual sides of the attack interact 
and we're able to give you a holistic idea about an attack. And instead of providing hundreds or thousands of incidents, provide you a single one or two that best describe the whole situation. We provide early warning capabilities, being able to detect incidents in real time and giving you a dashboard that gives you an understanding of what's currently happening in your network, uh, having all the different events prioritized and map, uh, mapped onto MITRE uh, attack framework, uh, showing you their trends and giving you uh, the ability to drill down into more detail. We automate the response with off-the-shelf um, uh, integrations with multiple uh, vendors, um, and those include SIEM and log management uh, tools like McAfee, Splunk, or IBM Q Radar, um, but also network access control, um, firewalls uh, from Fortinet uh, or Cisco uh, that can be instructed and orchestrated to block um, uh, an IP address. So to summarize, uh, the incident or attack described by Frank, and also to summarize how network detection and response uh, techniques can be used to uncover attacks in their early stages and how they can help us to respond, um, let me take you through this slide. So at the beginning, we need to have input data. Uh, that is network telemetry, ideally flow data, even flow logs from uh, public cloud platforms. Uh, we can also digest reputation feeds, threat intelligence information, uh, signatures of full packet data. We run all this through our detection algorithms that look for um, uh, events such as, um, such as a misuse of standard protocols for malicious um, activities such as exfiltrating data through ICMB protocol um, or uh, encrypted da encrypted da encrypting data on shared um, uh, network drives um, or infecting uh, stations with malicious code that then turn into bots and speak with some command control server outside of our network. And based on these algorithms and their detections, we provide evidence for your confident analysis and response to minimize the breach impact. Um, we would like you to uh, visit our website to read a little bit more about our capabilities in terms of detecting um, uh, ransomware. And we also have a special offer for you, uh, which is a 30-day trial um, where in your own network, you can test how uh, these, uh, how network detection and response can be beneficial to your security. And we will also help you by um, optionally, this is up to you, providing you an, an assessment of your um, security uh, protection and detected uh, incidents in your network. Frank, do we have some time for questions? Yes, we do have time for a few questions. Arthur, thank you very much. That was very insightful and very useful information on understanding how you can use network detection response, this NDR technology to really help identify and really ultimately protect yourself against these uh, ransomware attacks and these hackers uh, penetrating your network. So let me see here. I have a few questions here in terms of time I'll try to prioritize. And one is just a quick response. One is how useful has the MITRE attack metric been in your experience with defending against attacks and mitigation strategies? I know you talked a lot about in how MITRE attack and the, the framework is useful. Do you have a little more detail on understanding what the MITRE attack framework and metric has been in terms of how y'all have designed this, this technology? Yes, that's a great question. Let me close the slides for a bit now. Um, we know MITRE attack is, is a big trend. Uh, we see more and more vendors, uh, also customers talk about this. Uh, it is very useful in SOC environments, right? Uh, where um, understanding the uh, attack uh, stage is of crucial in, in, uh, importance in order to be able to prioritize our, uh, our, uh, our activities. So that can be one point of view, prioritization, understanding, understanding the, 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 the potential impact, and being able to navigate uh, across the 
number of logs and 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 picking picking up picking up on those that are important for my work right now. So that's one one point of uh, point of view. Uh, the the second one is in uh, uh, providing sort of common way of uh, different departments really understanding what is happening at this time and who needs to respond and what uh response technique we need to use so for for instance if we if we understand that an attack is in the stage of lateral movement we can talk to our networking department and ask them to stop the ip address from communicating further uh but you know in some other cases we need to use a different method and really understanding where we are at this point can give us this 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 this, this leverage. So yeah, to answer the question, prioritization good, widely used, but in my in my uh, uh, in my uh, in my uh, humble point of view, I, I also believe that being able to understand what is the remedial action uh, is a very important way of using my attack framework. Awesome, that's great. And a couple of housekeeping ones I'll clear out real quick here. Is first one is. May we can we get the slides for this terrific presentation? And I appreciate you saying that this is terrific. Uh, on that last slide, there is an email sales at flowmon.com. Send the request to the email address, and we're more than happy to send you a copy of this presentation. So that's for everybody that's listening to this. Send it to us at sales at flowmon.com, and we will send you a copy of the presentation and, and answer any other questions that you may have during that process as well. And the other one real quick to just clear out is we are currently using the Kemp LM3600 Lowmaster and planning to upgrade to the LMX15. Congratulations, that's a great product, by the way. What added advantage does this version come with? And the answer is that Flowmon is a technology uh, and a product that was acquired by Kemp. We came together, I, I, I don't like using the word acquired, we came together as a family uh, late last year and it's been a really good synergy with us and expect a lot in the new future on the integration and tying together of the Kemp load balancing load master solution and the and this and this really cool flowmon uh, detection response that does lots of different cool things in the very near future and using the LMX 15 and the latest uh, uh, products and hardware is going to give you a big advantage in terms of taking advantage of these features and capabilities. And I think we have time for one more question, Arthur, and this is one that is interesting. So hi, thanks. Can you please explain how encrypted data streams and payloads affect your solution? And that's a good question because encrypted, you can't see the encrypted payload. How how does this impact you, and what does it mean? Thank you for this question. Uh, most of the traffic today is encrypted, um, and of course, we can try to decrypt the traffic use SSL proxies, which is very expensive, um, and it's uh, uh, invading privacy. Uh, the 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 techniques used in network detection and response, and specifically Flowmon, we do not rely on being able to see into the payload, which is encrypted. We look into uh, statistical information. We look into IP headers, which are not encrypted. We don't stop there. Where we can, we go deeper into application layer. So we are able to see DNS um, uh, questions and answers. We're able to see uh, error codes. For HTTPS, encrypted HTTP traffic, we're able to get information from SNI, which means we can tell domains. Uh, we can tell a lot about SSL encryption itself by looking into SSL uh, encryption uh, uh, handshake. That being said, uh, not being able to see into payload doesn't stop us. We look into patterns of behavior. We look into how different uh, stations and, and systems communicate on the network. And we look in nuances in that. We don't need to be able to say what's inside of the traffic to be able to do our detection. Yes, Flowmon on demand can automatically start a packet capture. And so the full evidence for your forensic analysis as, uh, is at your disposal after the compromise is stopped. Um, but that, that depth of information is not used for detection primarily. 
That sounds great. And I completely agree. It's not just looking inside the payload that's important, but the behavior, the network statistics, the analysis of what's going on and where. Like hosts should be shouldn't be touching other hosts laterally. Uh, my desktop should not be touching other desktops. These are important things to know that you don't have to have the payload to understand what's going on. So yeah, and unencrypting traffic, it's heavy load in terms of doing it you have to have certificates requires a lot of processing power and then it becomes you become there's an exposure of potential man in the middle of text because now it's unencrypted and there's a vulnerability there in itself so yeah this is very useful information and it's great that you can do this without having to go to the heavy lifting of decrypting traffic so i appreciate everybody taking the time to listen to this we're a little over time we had some great questions i enjoyed this discussion thoroughly hopefully everybody else did too and i look forward to seeing y'all on the next webinar and sessions that we have and arthur thank you very much for everything that you've uh, presented today this was great information and again thank you everybody else for attending we will talk to you another time thank you see you soon